So it's good to be back with you here at 211 Campus. Um, man, it's so good. Thank you guys for allowing me to have a little break. But uh, if I haven't met you, I'm Jason. Get the honor to pastor here and got a lot to say. And God's doing a good thing. And it's a full house in the middle of summer, which is kind of wild. So that's cool. If you will, slide in for us a little bit as our guys keep letting guys get in if you got any uh, seats. But let me give you a little housekeeping. And by housekeeping... I've been on a break for a few weeks, and so obviously if you've been around Bethlehem, you know if Jason gets a break, he likes coming back and changing things. And so let me just, uh, just figured, you know, break, what can I change? But on a serious note, something we are doing that will begin in three weeks that affects both campuses. Uh, it's not a major shift. It's nothing that's uh, life-changing or life-altering, but it's something you're going to be aware of. On Sunday, July the 29th, if you have a child, they move up to their next grade the week before school starts back. Well, in doing that, we are bumping back our service times 15 minutes, and I'll explain why in just a second. So here at the 316 campus, in three weeks, okay, services will be moved back 15 minutes, 930, 1115, and 5. At our 211 campus, it'll be 945 and 1115, again, three weeks, July 29th. You'll see this, you'll get info about this, uh, but it'll happen in, in three weeks. Let me tell you why. We're a church predominantly made up of families, and families equal a lot of kids. And so to kind of help, if you will, balance out our kids' ministry environments, what I mean by that is our second service has more kids than our first service. Second service is pretty much full. Uh, the first service is almost there. But to kind of help us balance out because of kids' space issues, which are awesome problems, things you will be addressing when we get to January I'll be telling you more about that, but we're just moving service times back 15 minutes. Now, it doesn't seem like a big deal to you, but what you'll find is giving mama 15 extra minutes to get the babies ready, right, and get here helps out balance the time, and so that's all we're doing is moving it back 15 minutes uh, at both campuses, and also when we go into 2019, Again, going in 2019, we're looking at other options to add other service times, and this kind of helps us by moving it back to look if we're going to do earlier, to look if we're going to do later. So all we're doing is moving in 15 minutes back. So for some of you, all that means is show up when you normally do. You'll be fine, okay? <laughs> so show up when you normally do. We'll be, you'll be fine. For others of you, uh, if you get here at the normal service time and you're like, man, I forgot, guess what? You're 15 minutes early. No big deal. You know what I mean? No big deal. So that'll happen on July the 29th, both services, uh, five o'clock will stay the exact same here, uh, but the morning service has just moved back 15 minutes, kind of helping us balance out a few things. Is that cool? If it's not, I don't care, but still, uh, <laughs> it's all fine. Now, here's what I want you to look at somebody and sit next to you and go, not next week, but three weeks this starts. Do that right quick. <laughs> not next week. So over the summer... Hopefully you got a little vacation time. Anybody already been on vacation at all? Anybody had a vacation? Raise your hand, raise a high, raise a high. Anybody still got one coming? Raise a high, raise a high, raise a high. Yeah, June, July, usually if you got kids, you got to get a little vacation time in. And we got a chance to get away from the hustle and bustle and the, and the crowd and the push and the pull of everything. And it's good. I got to reflect, got to renew, got to refresh. And in that time, I always ask God to kind of reset some things in my heart. Refresh, renew, and I never know what that's going to be. Uh, but really, there were three thoughts while I was on break. Just three things that the Spirit of God wouldn't let go in my mind. Just things kept coming to my mind, you know, just, just that I want to share over the next few weeks. Can't get them all today, but I want to share over the next few weeks because it ties into where we're going. But the first is not profound. It's not something you've never heard. It's not something you ever thought. But this was just what God wouldn't let go of in, in me over break was people. The definition of life is people. Your life is defined by people. The mission, the meaning, the purpose of life, the centerpiece is people. And what God reminded me, that's not because you're a pastor, Jason. It's because you're a human being. Created to be in relationship with other people. Not only are you a human being, but you're a Christ follower. You're somebody who's given your life and followed Jesus. God has made rights. And from the beginning, if you're a follower of Christ, the mission of God has always been the centerpiece, his people. So with God, this is a simple phrase. People aren't a part of your life. They're the point of your life. People aren't a, point of, a part of your life, Jason, they're the point of your life. And think about it. Over the last six weeks since my father passed away, 
I've seen the best of people. Many of you reached out, blessed my family. We still get cards. We're still getting messages. So overwhelmed, so blessed by so many people who were so kind. You see the best of people. Right? You see the best in people in seasons like that. It was so refreshing for my family and I. Then we went to the beach for two weeks. And can I get a witness? You see the worst of people at the beach. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, there's just something about 95 degree weather, 15 feet from the water, and everybody loses any sense of self-awareness they've ever had. You know, come on, you can smile. I'm not going to get real graphic here, right? But you just want to go, I'm not quite sure that's the best outfit to be wearing, but who's saying? <laughs> that's neither here nor there. Best of people. Well, you know what I mean? It's like, come on, man. I mean, think about it. You can't walk around in that anywhere else, but here at the beach, it's like, oh, it's good. It's like, okay, well. <laughs> but whatever the most blessed part of your life right now, I mean, the part of your life that's going great. Like, you think about your life right now. This, like, there's a lot probably going great, some not going good, but whatever's going, like, this is just good right now. I bet you people are at the centerpiece of that. The burden in your life, the weight that you're carrying, like, this is just difficult. I bet you people are at the center of that as well. Right? I bet you people are centered about at that as well. People are not just part of your life. They're the point of your life. And that old statement, you can't see or he, she can't see, he can't see the forest for the trees. Anybody ever heard that? It's the simple idea that you're looking right at what's right in front of you. You're missing the big picture of life. I think many of us in our prosperity, in our pace, Pastor Matt Pilon talked about that. In the things and stuff of our life, we've become people that, that see people as a part of our life and forget they're at the point of our life. And by people, I mean just not the people in the four walls of your house. I'm talking about the people that encompass your life. And that's easy to do. It's really easy to do because I put this in your notes. When you think about it, here's what God had to refresh in me. If you think about it, we have a tendency in our fast pace, everybody's prosperous, moving their life, thriving, going, right? There's a tendency when you think about people, and, and, I, and this is some God that's kind of set in me, so just reminding you, our people are not problems to be solved. You know what I mean? Like, like do people have problems? No doubt about it. Do people cause problems in your life? Nobody's arguing that. Are there people at your work? Are there people in your field? Are there people that share an office with you? Are there people in your family that seem to be problematic? I'm not arguing that. You better believe it. But that our tendency is to, our default is to see people as problems to be solved. There's something off in a heart like that. Church, God reminded me, when it comes to people in our fast-paced life, we oftentimes see people as projects to be managed. People aren't projects to be managed. Like if you're doing a home repair, you get a home project, like you size it up, what am I gonna to need to do this? Like, do I have the time? Do I have the margin? What am I gonna to need to accomplish that? At the Brit household, that means if it involves changing a light bulb, I got it. Anything else, I call my father-in-law in, you know what I mean? Anything else. But just, that's me, knowing me. Can I handle this? Can I do this? When we look at people and think to ourselves, do I have margin for another person in my life? Can I fit them in? Do I have what it takes? My friends, we see them as projects and people are not projects to be solved. Here we go. But you know what else? People aren't plagues to be avoided either. I mean, come on. But we gotta be honest, man. There are people in your life right now, they're a vortex of drama. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's just like when they come, and when they're around and when they're doing their thing, I mean, it's just drama. And, and truthfully, it's just like it's easier not to deal with them. Some of you work, man. You're in the workplaces. You got people who work with you or people who work for you. And you know, man, oh, man, if I can get through the day without having to cross paths with because he or she's going to bring something with them. You know what I'm saying? Anybody or is that just me? Right? Right? You know, they're just a vortex of drama. You know, it's just kind of one of those things. Damaged goods. Life has hurt them. And when life hurts people, hurt people, hurt people. That type thing. And here's what the Lord reminded me of. People are meant to be loved. 
Now, if I were you and I heard say that, here, here's what I'm, well, I'm not talking about some noble attempt to be a really nice person on a good day. I'm also not talking about religious mumbo jumbo kind of wishy washy. Jason's been on vacation. He comes back going, oh, golly, geez, guys, can't we all just hold hands and get along? Oh, yeah, the pastor says love. Wow, that's profound there. No, no, no. What I'm saying is, listen to me, there's an intuitive nature to the mission of God, an intuitive nature to Christ's followers that's tied to this posture of love and blessing that for us to have any other initial reaction to people in our lives is to be far from the mission of God. Is to be far from the mission of God. And I think in our personal space, in our insulated lives, in our walled off lives where all of us, including me, me, myself, and I, our pace, our things, we have a tendency to miss the whole point of life. We fundamentally separated God's mission and our purpose. Like the purpose of God and God's mission isn't just Jason as the pastor, that means God has a mission. No, God's on mission. Our God who we worship, who we just sang to, there's a mission of God that your life is intrinsically tied to, whether you're a plumber, whether you're a salesman, whether you're in government work, whether you're a stay-at-home mom, whether you're in insurance, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're in the medical field, whether you work in a hardware store, whether you teach or whether you coach, your purpose is not first and foremost your role as a parent and your job. As a Christ follower, the mission of God is tied to what you do and why you do it. And I think we've separated that. See, here, here, here's what I want you to put down. So we're going to talk about the next few weeks. Mission, church, if you're a Christ follower, is something we are all, not something we do. Mission's not a trip we take. The people of God have always been a sent people a people on the go, a people who lean, lean in and kind of lean forward. Not a people who bunker, listen to me, who bunker down and mind my own business and keep myself and my family right all together in one piece. We become a people who love singing songs about how God, how God loves us and hear messages about how God has a purpose for us. But for all people is tied to the mission of God. And I want you to see it if you got your Bibles, Genesis chapter 12. Because to be candid, what I want you to hear is I don't think all Christians are missionaries. So take a deep breath. So you're like, man, what's he talking about? Mission, evangelism, dude, I, you know, I got to pay the bills. I don't think all Christians are missionaries. And the fact that people leave their land and go to a foreign land and preach the gospel, we have them in this church. We've sent them out in this church. We'll continue to do that. But I don't think all Christians are called to do that, but I do think everybody lives on mission. Some people pack up their stuff and leave. Others stay right where they're at and open up their eyes. And you open up your eyes more than just your little kids. For all people. Before I preach, Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. God sets things in motion. The story of God, the mission of God, God sets uh, his story. He writes himself into human history, and it begins with a covenant he makes with Abraham. After sin enters the world, you see the cataclysmic effects of sin in Genesis 3 through chapter 11. Genesis 12, here's what it says. Now the Lord said to Abram, the mission of God preceding Jesus, Jesus being the culmination of that mission, but God always being a missionary God, not a God who stands back and is aloof and distant, but a God who leans in to his people. Listen to this language. Now the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I'm going to show you. He was a nomad. He was a sheep herder. That's all he was. And here's what it says. And I will make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and those who dishonor you. I will curse and you and all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The entire purpose of Abraham in the Old Testament and the people of Israel was that they were not going to be blessed for the sake of being spoiled rotten and having more than everybody. So everybody would see, man, how awesome Israel. So that must be what God's like. No, 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 no. But that they would be a vessel of blessing to the entire world. That's what he just said. His call, what we call a covenant. He made a relationship. I'm going to bless you, Israel. Abraham, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. You've been nobody. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. But it's not just going to be for your sake. 
but for the sake of others. That language of blessing, that is tied to the first three verses where you see God making a relationship, restoring relationship with mankind. The people of Israel in the Old Testament existed to be a blessing, a vessel of blessing to the entire world. Think about that line, blessing. When somebody blesses you with word or deed, somebody comes along and encourages you, you know what you feel? You feel like they are for you and with you. God's posture, God's leaning, when he looks at Abraham and says, Abraham, you and Israel are going to be a blessing to the entire world. The mission of God, the posture is a posture of blessing. Think about it. When you are blessed, when somebody blesses you, when you choose to bless somebody, spend time, help out, lean in, you know they are for you and with you. There's no question about it, all right? They are for you and with you. But if you keep reading Genesis, you know Abraham didn't always get this right. Lord knows Israel rarely did. They were convinced of God's blessing for them. They just seemed to forget that God's blessing for them was to be for other people, for all people, and not just them. I've been doing some thinking. Now, this is not necessarily Bethlehem Church, but I'm going to make a statement here. I think the church in America is not far off from the early nation of Israel. We're 100% convinced of God's blessing for us. We're God's people in a dark world where his chosen in Christ Jesus. And we love singing songs. He's alive. Yeah. Woo. We love hearing messages. Man, that's right. God loves me. No matter what I do, God loves me. I love that. And you better believe God's got a plan for my life. Praise the Lord. God's got a plan for my life. He's got a plan for little Johnny. He's got a plan for little Susie. He's got a plan for us all. We are God's people. We've just forgotten that the blessing for us that God gave is not just a blessing for us, but that we would bless others and others would see that he is the one true and living God. The blessing to Abraham was not just for Abraham. The blessing was for all people. Some of you that that know the Old Testament, you're like, wait a second. It was never, look at Israel, look how great they are. They got it hijacked and it became Israel and how great they were. In a bad, bad world, but we're sticking together. And all I'm saying is there's a posture of blessing that you see the mission of God take. It's bigger than just Israel. Listen to me. God's mission is bigger than those now in Christ Jesus, just the church. God's going to protect me no matter what happens in this world. Things kind of shaky out there, you know? Things kind of dark, but me and my babies, because I don't pray for them, God's going to protect us. God's blessing, God being for all people, is more than just you. It's more than just Christians, too. So Jesus comes on the scene, and he fulfills this. And Jesus says in Matthew 28, before he goes back to the Father, he says, go, therefore, into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I'm with you, always to the end of the earth. So you've seen me unconditionally accept you. I am sending you on a mission of invitation, not condemnation. Hello. For God so loved the world that he gave. Now, he didn't send his son to condemn the world. So the church, the disciples, were on a mission of invitation, not condemnation. Jesus comes on the scene in Luke chapter 4, and he takes the words of the prophet Isaiah and says, it's fulfilled to me. Look what he says. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Now, when the poor receive good news, you know what they feel? Blessed. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. When somebody's in captivity, gets free, you know a word they would use that describes their situation? Blessed. Sight to the blind. Somebody who's blind now can see, you know what they'd say? I am highly favored and blessed. The posture of the church of Christ's followers has always been blessing to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Here's where I want to press. If being a blessing, like when you think of the word mission, if you've been in church, it's not just a trip. When you think of the word evangelism, it's not just about me saying, raise your hand if you got saved. But we've lost that. The initial posture is a posture of blessing. 
The mission of God's always been about blessing. And so if the mission of God fulfilled in the people of Christ, their initial posture is one of blessing. Why is it that there are a ton of other words that an outside world defines us at other than people who are blessed or people who bless? What do you mean? Like there's an outside world of world nominal faith, uh, uh, not, not believers, different religious belief or no religious belief. And if you do the research, what you find is the words of people who are a blessing and the people who are for all people don't relate with us. What are you saying? Unchristian's a book written a few years back by Dave Kinnaman Gabe Lyons. Biggest research done of a secular audience, and so by that, people outside of faith, asking about their views of people of faith. The target audience was the next generation, 30 and down. And they gave, one of the questions they gave to scriptors, some of them positive and some of them negative, and said, you just mark the ones that you think define Christians. This was hundreds of thousands. This is a major survey, the most comprehensive survey of view of Christians, of born again, what some people refer to in, in political blocks as evangelicals, which I'll get to in a second. And the stats they came back with with these descriptors, here were the highest percentage of terms that came back to Christians. Judgmental was 87%. 85% hypocritical. Too involved in politics, 75%. Oh, boy, I could stop there, but I'm not. Insensitive to others, people who are called to be a blessing. Christians, well, they're insensitive to others, 70%. Boring, 68%. I got to agree because I've met some and they can be boring. You know what I mean? I'm smiling here. Come on. 61% confusing. 91% anti-homosexual. Simply put, in the minds of many, Christianity seems no longer Christian. When we have be let ourselves become defined by what we are against and the posture of mission has always been about what we are for. Now, let me play devil's advocate because I know you are in your head, especially if you're older than me. You're playing devil's advocate here with me and you're thinking, oh, I hear you, but, but listen, Jason, isn't that a secular media's kind of their description, their characterization of Christians? Isn't that like a, a secular, some people like going to liberal media? Isn't that just their description of Christians? Here's what I would say. We've get, you're, you're, that's, that's true, but you better believe we've given them plenty of fuel for the fire. We've given them plenty of ammo to fire, man. Come on. Let me play never's devil's advocate. Some of you have been in church for a while. Well, bless God, isn't the gospel offensive? I mean, the gospel message is just offensive. I agree with you. Jesus said, I'm the only way. In a world that doesn't like, like exclusives, like final statements, Jesus says, I'm the only way. Our problem is not that we offend them with the gospels. We offend them with everything else and never get to the gospel. That's our problem. Listen. Bethlehem, you're, you guys are a different breed. 211, you're a different breed. I'm not saying this is true. I think God's given us favor in a Christian community in our area, in a lost community in our area. It's an easy church to invite people who don't think just like they do. But listen, what I'm saying is we've taken the posture of blessing as a whole. Individually, though, you understanding mission and evangelism is about you in, encompassing, you getting this idea of the initial posture toward people. Not just your kids, not just your grandkids, not just people who make you comfortable, but all people is this posture of blessing. Blessing was the posture of mission, like the natural inclination. What are you saying? What does it mean to be a blessing in a world where the lines, right, where there's divisions? Here's what I'm saying. I want you to write this down. When I talk about blessing, here it is. Our first instinct has to be to build a bridge and not draw a line. I need you to listen to me. We have got to be a church that doesn't bunker down, this is huge, and say, here's what we believe. 
unless you think just like we do, then we don't really have a spot for you. That's not for all people. We are comfortable with people to associate who think like us and act like us. And we love to draw lines around people who think like us and act like us. Here's the problem with that. Most people in your life, if you open your eyes wide open, they don't think just like you and they don't act just like you and they're the point. For all people means it's not about, we, we've made this thing, well, once you get on page with us, then we're more than happy for you. That's the farthest thing from the mission of God. We're coming for you. You're gonna have to make a decision at some point, but the people of God are gonna come with a mission of blessing to start everything off. We're gonna be a build, uh, whatever that is, that's what we're gonna be. <laughs> we're gonna build a bridge, not draw a line. I am putting a foot in the sand and saying, if the church of the past was fantastic and going, erecting this wall, going, look at us. You need to think like us, hop our theological hoops, make sure you're in 100% agreement on everything. My goodness, people, listen to me. The differences between people, the, Jesus had, was different than everybody and his differences drove them to those people, not away from them. Our differences with people have to drive us to them, not away from them. The comfortable thing to do in 2018 is to bunker down, pat ourselves on the back and go, man, we're the last good people alive. <laughs> it's just world so bad. So much darkness. Me and my babies were going to heaven. That's the easy thing to do. The posture of missing mission has always been blessing. Has always been blessing. Now, at the beach a few weeks ago. I, got, I ran up to the condo and to get some stuff and I was coming back down and you know, it was one of the days you go to the beach, green means everybody get in and swim and have fun. Yellow means be a little cautious, the undertow something. Red means undertow's happening. You can go out there, but you gotta be cautious. Well, it was a red day. My two oldest, one gonna be in sixth grade, one gonna be in fifth grade. My wife had told them, stay right in front of me and the, the waves don't look huge, but the undertow, the riptide's really pulling you. I go up to the condo to get some stuff and I come back down about 15 minutes later and my two oldest, my wife's got her hands on her hip and she's just giving it to them, okay? And but you're like, your sweet wife, listen, when you, she can get, look, you gotta watch out. And my kids, what had happened was they'd gotten in the ocean, they'd gotten way down. She was talking to Caleb, my youngest over here and they'd gotten pulled kind of way down. They weren't deep, they weren't far but they were way away from where they wanted to be, where they were supposed to be. And they understood this, but they could not get back because the current was pushing them so much. And it scared them. Now, obviously, they're here, they're breathing, everything worked out fine, okay? <laughs> but it scared them. And so my wife is having to come to Jesus with them about, I told you, and this is dangerous, what was horrifying, they did, they had this horror look in their face. What was horrifying was they saw where they were supposed to be, but they didn't have the power to get back there. Listen to me. I think the problem for us is we're so far away from where we're supposed to be, and we don't even know it. Because we're convinced as long as we talk to each other about Jesus and hear messages about he, he loves us and he's for us and he's going to be with us and all We've got to realize that message is not just for those who agree with us. The gospel's for all people. That the posture of blessings for all people. Listen to me. Here's what I want you to write down. Two thoughts. When it comes to your influence with other people, you are your biggest obstacle to the influence you want to have with others. Just you. If you've been at Bethlehem any time at all, you know I think the greatest movies ever made are the Rocky movies. Rocky Balboa, right? I think every one of them should have won an Academy Award. How they didn't, I don't know. His latest movie a couple years back was called Creed. It's about Rocky, who's now an aged, retired boxer, training his best friend's son. His best friend's died. Rocky got the guy back for that, but his best friend's died. And so now Rocky's training his son, Adonis. And one of the best scenes is, He's training his uh, best friend's son. They're looking in the mirror and he goes, and honest, listen to me. Your biggest obstacle when you get in that ring is the person looking right back at you. It's a great scene. 
When you get in the ring, the biggest person, the biggest opponent you got is the guy looking at you in the mirror every time. What I want to say to you is those of you, your biggest obstacle to the influence God has for you in a lost and broken world, every morning is the person staring right back at you in that mirror. That's your biggest obstacle. It's not that the world has changed and what you believe and what the world believes, the chasm is so great, you can't make a difference. No. It's not that you don't, have enough, don't know enough about Jesus or been following Jesus enough or know enough about the Bible. That's not it. You and I's biggest obstacles, our prosperity and our default to be committed to me, myself, and I. Your biggest obstacle is the fear of being inadequate. Your shame of who you used to be. Even though the whole Christian message, the whole Christian gospel has always been carried by people who were full of shame and felt inadequate, somehow we think, well, I don't have what it takes. It's your innate insecurities that you don't have what it takes. Who would ever listen to me? What difference can I make? Your biggest obstacle, and I'll talk about this next week a lot, is indifference. What do you mean indifference? Like apathies, I don't care. Y'all know apathy. Anybody got it? Like you ever had a teenager, you know apathy. Like, you know, not every, not all teenagers, but there's something in a teenager's life they just don't care about. And you see, they're apathetic toward it. I don't care. Come on, you know what I'm saying? The difference between apathy and indifference. Apathy is I don't care. Indifference is I know I should and I still don't. I think we're plagued with the sin of indifference. God's got full confidence in you, as you are. God has more confidence in you than you have when it comes to being an influence, right where you're at, in your neighborhood, at your work, with all your dysfunction and all your issues. God wants to use you. And the next few weeks are about me reminding you of that. And let me tell you why this is so important. Here's the other thing God has not let go of me. Every person you meet is eternal. Every person you meet is eternal. So six weeks ago, I buried my father. But what I know and my comfort in all that is he's now more alive than he's ever been before. Because my dad's in heaven. I believe that. Just like when you lose somebody, you grieve. I've grieved. And I'll continue to do that. But I don't grieve as a person who doesn't have hope. The comfort and confidence I have is my dad's in eternity with Jesus. I believe that. But here's the part that the Lord's kind of been, wouldn't let me go. If that is true, and I believe it is, and my father's in heaven, then the other eternal realities at play too. I think as believers, we've become so confident and hopeful of heaven that we forgot Jesus talks about hell 10 times more than he does heaven. And just as I've been comforted by the idea and the reality that my dad's in heaven, the Holy Spirit's convicted me and says there's a whole other eternal reality at play. Every person you meet, every person in your life, every person in your family, every person at your workplace, every person in your neighborhood, every person at your school, Every person is eternal. There's never been somebody born who will cease to exist one day. And I think we are hypocritical as people when heaven becomes our hope and hell is not our horror. Because Jesus talked about hell a lot more than he did heaven. And let me say this. It's not real popular for guys like me to talk about hell. Because it's portrayed as being strong-armed, scaring people, scare tactics. What I am saying is every person you'll ever meet will end at one of two destinations, heaven or hell. And if that doesn't prick our heart, my God, people, we suffer from a sin of indifference. If that doesn't nudge us and put a lump in our throat, every person you meet is eternal. That's the core of our belief. And if on some level that doesn't press into us, God have mercy on us. And my fear is we become people, heaven, it's going to be good. 
It gets bad here. Loved ones in heaven, 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 heaven. And how hypocritical for us to be comforted, comforted by heaven, but not motivated by the realities of a hell. See, mission, listen to me, is not just about you doing something new. It's about you opening the eyes, open your eyes wide open to right where you're at, the workplace you're at, the people you're around. I've met people at Bethlehem Church who aren't perfect people, who are ordinary, everyday people working nine to five jobs that believe their life is mission. I've met them, I've seen them. That what they do in their workplace, they're on mission. And I want you to hear from two friends of mine that have been in Bethlehem longer than me. They're at our 211 campus, helped us start up there. But I've seen their life lived on mission and it's encouraged me and it's reminded me what it looks like to live on mission. Meet my friends, Tony and Sherry Haberman. It's pretty much a revolving door because we're empty nesters, but we have four kids. One just moved back in. Yep. Um, He works, I work. What else? We have another one threatening to move back in, which we love. We do. Threatening we do. It's not a good word. Like. <laughs> no, but uh, you know, you you say when you become empty nesters, your kids are gone, but that would be sad. It really would yeah, be. Yeah, they do hang out with us a lot, and we love it. Yeah, so we'd rather them be right here now. than somewhere else. Well, for me, I'm I'm up at. 4.30, get home at about 5, and, um, you know, there's always stuff to do, whether it's with our kids or with church, and, you know, there's never a dull moment, and there's always opportunities to serve not only our kids but, but others, and, you know, we, we stay busy. We think that, hey, we have no kids at home, but that's that's not true, but that's, that's who we are. It's like Sherry said earlier, it's a revolving door. I like to ask the guys at work, how the weekend was? You know, what did y'all do? They'll ask me, what did you do? And I said, I went to church. We had a great attendance. How about yours? Well, I really don't go to church. Oh, and then it just kind of, then I can start witnessing to them. And I, I can do that with strangers, but I like to get somebody to know somebody. It, it only takes a couple minutes. For me, it's more, it's still that thing of, of who God brings about. Um, a door always swings open that you can just like it's just conversation mm -hmm. it's having them over to to do something in the kitchen or take or go to breakfast with somebody or something like that yeah. and and um it's just relationships uh my favorite son-in-law and i went hiking and my daughter and uh we met a guy on the trail just happened to meet up with him as soon as we got out of the car and um Turns out he was from Chicago. I was born in Chicago. Turns out he's an electrician. I sell to electricians, and so within minutes, uh, we were buddies, and then we got to share Christ with him, you know, up, up in the mountains. So I, I thought, you know, that's just, that's just how I witnessed. And what's funny is I was getting ready for bed, and I, I knew that Taylor was gonna beat me to the punch, and he did. And, uh, and he had some similar things with Taylor. So there yeah. again, God brought this person that that exact moment he put that guy on the trail. Yeah. When when they were on the trail, and it's like, how could you think it was anything else? My story, I can relate to the people who don't believe it because I didn't believe it for 28 years, and it took two years for me sitting in church for God to say. I want you. Mm -hmm. God pursued me until I accepted him as my Lord and Savior. It's not really our story, it's God's story. He has this great big story, and we're just this, this is just the character of Tony at this moment and the character of Sherry in it. It's like, um, we're just this small part. So when we do tell our story, we can say, but this is God's story, and this is, this is what he did with it, and this is what he's doing with it, and what he's done with it. And um, so, so it really is about him. Take a season of your life to get to know him through his word. The more you know God, the more natural it will just come out.
he's he is either your all or he's not and the closer you get to him the more he just takes over and and it's less you and it's more him you know we just get to a point where you know we always don't witness when god's saying okay you know you're up and we blow it we we just miss an opportunity but other times you know we have to remember his word like you said to say okay i got this you know start speaking tony and sharing and your will. faith yeah. and i will give you words to say because you know what you have the holy spirit you know it's, and he it's, does it's, put it in it's, you he it's, will give he's you in words. me he he who is in me is greater than he who is in his world and you know it's it's just amazing when you start to witness to somebody you just say stuff you don't remember what you said 10 minutes later because it was all god his word gives light and gives understanding to the simple so no matter how simple you think you are if you read that word he's going to put it in you and he's going to bring it back out when it when the time's needed i love that sherry her phrase is either all god or it's nothing normal everyday people known sherry and tony for a while believe their life's on mission it's either all god or it's nothing let me let me say this to you if that is true and i believe it is here's what that means 100 percent of the people in your life they're either there on purpose or they're not it's not either or back row front row 211 back row front row if it's all god or nothing this is either all by accident or there's purpose to it it's one or the other we kind of like, well, so, like some things are on purpose and some things are, no, 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 it's, it's all or nothing. And the sovereign God of this universe, every person in your life is either there on purpose or by accident. The mission of God, the posture has been blessing. This is me saying evangelism and mission, our influence is not about me standing up here beating my chest going, you bet. It's about the people of God, our first motive is being a people of blessing. We're with you. We're for you. Sight to the blind. Freedom to the captive. Some of you listen to me. Well, here's what that means. Here's what I want you to put as we close. Here's what I want to invite you. A prayer. I've been praying for six months. In January, I began praying this. God, give me a heart for people like you. God, help me see people the way you do. Listen to me. I know you're like, well, I already do that. I'm telling you right now, you don't. All of us have a tendency in a world that gets worn out and tired to see people through lenses that aren't the heart of God. And what I've seen is God, as the hostility and the vitriol in our culture continues to rise. It's been crazy how instead of joining in that course, God set my heart free. And you know what he's done? Broke my heart for the state of the world instead of make me choose sides. The people of God are people of mission. A blessing. As we close, I was on over break. I had a little time and I was looking back. Some of you, not a lot of you, but some of you have been here with me for seven years now. I'm looking around the room, seeing some that have been with me for seven years now. I've been here. I look back at some of my early messages, like 2011 and 2012. And first of all, if you've been here seven years, thank you. Because forgive me for those early days. Forgive me for that, okay? Forgive me. But I remember looking back at some of my world break. And I do a family series in the fall. We've done that for a few years because everybody's in family. Everybody's trying to figure it out. And I remember, it. this is when Nan and I have a three-year-old, a two-year-old, a zero-year-old, right? He just has been born. I remember kind of standing up there and I'm going to preach on parenting and my message basically came down to something like this. If you were here, forgive me, it's my bad. But it basically came down to something like this. Seven things every godly parent should do. Well, then I looked like two years later in my messages and it was like, I came back to parenting and it was like four things that might help, right? <laughs> so this year in the family series, it's going to be I don't know. Just try this. I don't know. Because I got one going into middle school. So, yeah, I don't know. Just try this. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. We'll all see. But listen, you know this is true when it comes to parenting. All of us in this room, whether you've had a parent or you are now a parent, here's what you know. 
The role of a parent, at the end of the day, boil it down, simplify it. There's a whole lot to it. But there are things your kids think are real important that you know that aren't, that it's not that important. And part of your job as a parent is helping mold that kid. I know you think this is such a big deal, I know, but it's really not that big a deal. And part of the job of a parent is doing that. But then there are other things that our kids don't think are that important. And part of our role as a parent is going, no, 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 no. This is what matters, right? You and I have a father in heaven who looks at his kids and says, I know you think this is a big deal, but it's not. I know you think this is a big deal, but it's not. I know you think your future, your career, your bank account, that, no, that's what you think's a big deal, how people view you, but I'm telling you what's a big deal is the people I've placed in your life. And I know you don't think this is a big deal, but our Father loves us too much, and He is a good Father. And you know what He does? He directs our heart. This series, all it is, is not about me giving you 10 techniques. It's about saying if we don't have a heart for people, that includes all people, then we are far from the heart of God.